Good morning. We begin our order of worship this morning on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, through the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our Savior's Way Lutheran Church online this morning. We're very happy you've joined us for worship as you, and as we gather together to worship through this electronic medium. My name is Pastor Dave Laboon, Pastor Laboon the Elder, and I'll be leading this traditional service together with our preacher, Pastor Eric Peterson, and our choir. If you're new to our Savior's Way, we welcome you and encourage you to learn more about us at our website at oswlc.org or on our Facebook page. Before we continue our worship and praise, we have a few announcements this morning. First, in-person worship, I am very pleased to announce to you that next Sunday, July 26th, we are planning to begin in-person worship here at our Savior's Way. Thanks be to God. 
If you wish to attend in person, you will need to make a reservation, however. Information regarding a reopening plan and all the precautions which we are taking can be found at our website at oswlc.org. Many of you have been waiting for this opportunity, so please check the website and make your reservation. Even though we will meet together next week in person, we will also continue to provide worship videos each Sunday for those church members who feel uncomfortable attending in-person worship services. Please continue to look for Sunday worship videos beginning at 8 a.m. on our website, oswlc.org, OSWLC app and Facebook for information. While we continue to worship online, we'd be pleased to hear from you and know that you're with us in worship. Please complete the connection card, which is found on our website whenever you worship with us. The connection par card can be found on the worship page and is highlighted in bold blue letters. For those of you viewing on Facebook, you'll find the connection card there as well. We've been asking for the names of recent graduates for several weeks now, and at the end of today's worship service, we will present a video that highlights all of our 2020 OSWLC graduates. We'd ask you to stay tuned for this video and also pray for these young people who have successfully graduated as they pursue the next steps in their lives in service to God and their neighbors. And we conclude our announcements this morning with a message from Dan and Michelle Sherbeski, OSWLC members and Campus Crusade missionaries as they tell us what has happened and what is happening in their ministry during these challenging times. And so, Dan and Michelle. Hello, I'm Daniel Sherbinsky and this is my wife, Melissa. We're on staff with CREW in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia, working on the Tidewater Metro team. Our mission with CREW is to win students to Christ, build them up in their faith, and then send them out as lifelong laborers for Christ. The season has been challenging for all of us. As you may know, students were sent home on short notice and expected to complete the semester online. This left our seniors having to graduate without many of the traditions and without all of their community around them. Some of the challenges that we faced have been learning how to do ministry virtually. We've had lots of Zoom calls and lots of discussions with our team and we found that a lot of students are now at home and struggling in isolation and being away from their communities. However, we still believe that God is moving even during this time of quarantine. A friend of ours shared that this generation of college students is the most prepared to be ministered to virtually. All discipleship and large group meetings have been moved online through FaceTime, and Google Hangout, and Zoom, but this has allowed unique opportunities. We've had large group meetings with all seven campuses in our scope, and this gave students the chance to interact with those they normally wouldn't have because they go to different colleges. We've also had to make adjustments for our summer. So normally, CREW has tremendous opportunities for students to grow on short-term and long-term summer mission trips, and also different events that we have locally. Unfortunately, we've had to cancel most of these trips. Despite canceled summer missions, though, our team is still offering many ways for students to grow and to be poured into. Weekly prayer meetings and a 10-week theology course are just some of these chances that we're hosting for students. Yeah, while our team is focusing on virtual ministry, Melissa and I are also devoting our attention to raising our initial support so that we can continue to join our team in the ministry, as well as grow in our theological education. Melissa is pursuing a class through Cruz Institute of Biblical Studies, and then I've begun a master's degree at Reformed Theological Seminary. We've seen God tremendously provide during this time, and we've been so encouraged by what he's done. And we're currently at 97% of our initial support, and we're so excited to join our team here soon. There are still many unknowns moving forward with the fall semester, and our team is prepared and excited for the different um, things that universities are planning as we look ahead. And it's been encouraging watching the students trust God in the midst of so many challenges and unknowns, and we're eager to continue walking with them through the summer and into the fall. If you'd like to reach out to us, we'll put our emails here, and so please connect if you want to receive our prayer letter. Um, but we also want to just let you know we're so grateful for you and we're so grateful for your partnership in the gospel as we reach students. We want to also let you know that we're praying for you. And so please reach out if we can 
pray for you in any specific way. Thank you. We continue with the intro. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seek my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You be with you and also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit that, ever mindful of your final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness of living here and dwell with you in perfect joy hereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading this morning is from the 44th chapter of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. Good morning, boys and girls. Welcome back to our children's message here in the middle of our worship service at Our Savior's Way. I'm so glad you're here as we learn about what God's Word means for us. If this is one of your first times here, let me introduce myself. My name is Mr. Ray, and these are my kids, Judah, Quinn, and Cora. Uh, uh what? Oh, I, I maybe made a mistake. This is, this is Cora, and this is Quinn. You guys look so much alike. Have you guys, maybe this has happened to you where you have siblings, where you get called their, your sibling's name by your, your, maybe your parents or family members, maybe because you look so similar. I know, I know some twins that I really have a hard time keeping track of who is who. And that's perfect for our children's message today because we're gonna learn about some plants that look really, really similar. I'm gonna show them to you now as I show them to my kids. My first plants that I'm gonna show you guys are up on 
our screen here. And the names of these two plants, the first one, the ones on the left, they're wild grapes. And the ones on the right are Canadian moon seed. And if you eat the Canadian moon seed, you could get very, very sick. It's poisonous. The same is true for these fruits here. I have wild blueberries and the other ones on the right are Tutsin berries, and they're also fruit that you shouldn't eat. Kind of like the berries that we saw outside the other day. We don't know if they could be good berries or bad berries. Now, yeah, it was yesterday. Now, there are some other plants that Jesus is going to tell us about in our gospel reading. It's wheat and tares. And you probably have never seen tares before, but look at these now. See how similar wheat and tares look. Now, the wheat is the food we really want to eat, and the tares, they tend to grow up over the wheat and can make the wheat die and just get sick. And so, those guys look, those, those two things look very, very similar, right? Yeah. Yeah, they look so similar. But in Jesus' story, he tells this parable, which are stories that teach us about God's kingdom. And in this, the story, a farmer plants good seed, plants wheat, and someone comes in, an enemy comes and plants these weeds, these tares in with the wheat. And the workers in the field ask the farmer if they should tear out, if they should pull out the tares. But the farmer says, no, they can hurt the wheat if you do that. Now, in this story, at the end, the farmer, after everything grows up, he separates the, the wheat from the tares. And here's what it means for us, boys and girls. Only God knows our hearts. Only God knows if we are making good fruit like wheat or those wild blueberries or wild, uh, wild grapes, or if we're producing bad fruit, if we are kind of just look like we're pretending to follow Jesus. But here's what I want to encourage you guys today to do to follow Jesus and produce good food, fruit. No, he loves you so very much, and he wants you to truly follow him, not just to pretend or make, make it look like you're following him, but to really follow him. No, he loves you so very much. So boys and girls, let's come, down, come sit down and fold our hands and pray and thank God that he knows us. He knows our hearts. He knows when we're following him that he would help us to do just that. So fold your hands, close your eyes, and bow your heads and pray after me. <laughs> Dear, Jesus, Dear Jesus, we thank you, we thank you that you know, that you know if, we're following you, if we're following you, help us, help us to love you, to love you with, our whole hearts, with our whole hearts and do good things that show, that show that we love you, that we love you. To, produce that good fruit. to produce that good fruit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Thank you, boys and girls, for joining us for our children's message. We'll continue with our worship now. Have a wonderful week. Bye. Bye. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he said, No, 
lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the harvest time I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is in the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun, and in the kingdom of their Father, he who has ears, let him hear. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we all have questions about faith. We all look at life and wonder at times about the things of God. For instance, we have a question like, if God is good, then why is there so much evil in the world? Or if God is all-powerful, why doesn't it just get rid of the evil? I'm sure you have your own questions. And the good news is that God answers our questions in his word. Uh, today's gospel is a parable about an owner of a field who personally planted good seed in his field with the intention of producing a rich harvest of wheat. But an enemy came under the cover of night and he planted darnel seeds into his field. Darnel is a weed that looks like wheat when it's growing but has a toxic fruit when it matures. And when the owner's servants are working in the field, they see the field is filled with weeds, and they're appalled by it, and they go back to the owner and they say, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did all the seed weeds come from? Well, the owner replied that an enemy did this. The servants being upset about that and wanting to help said to the owner, Do you want us to pull up all the weeds? And the owner replied, No. If you pull up the weeds, you may root out the wheat with them, 
So let the wheat and the weeds grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to collect the weeds, bundle them up to be burned, and then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Uh, this parable is a great parable, but it's fortunately Jesus does help us and explain it to the disciples, and this is what he said. The one who owned, or the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. Uh, the field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy. Who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Uh, so the question is, then what do we learn from this? First, God owns the field, uh, just like he owns the world and everything in it. Second, God only puts good in the world. Third, the seeds the owner plants are those who believe in Christ. God plants people of faith into the world to produce a rich harvest of blessing to the world to glorify God. But fourth, the work that the servants are given or the uh, sons of the kingdom is not going to be easy because the devil plants people into our lives who pull us away from God and discourage our faith. For the devil desires to destroy God's harvest, but in the end, there will be judgment, and God's goodness will prevail. That's the good news. You know, every day our faith is being tested. People are either pulling us away from God, or they're pulling us toward God. Uh, there's no neutral ground, and none of us are exempt from this spiritual struggle. And I'd like to just share two examples of how people can be used to distract us from doing the will of God. Uh, people don't have to be bad. Uh, th these are the people that love us and the people we love uh, can be involved in distracting us from doing the will of God. Uh, one of the examples would be uh, Jesus with his conversation with Peter. Right after Peter confesses to Jesus that he is the, uh, the Messiah and that he is the Son of God, Jesus announces to Peter and to the disciples that he was going to go to Jerusalem, he was going to suffer, and that he would die. But on the third day, that he would rise again. When Peter hears what Jesus is saying, that he's going to have to suffer, that if he goes to Jerusalem, that he would die, he rebukes Jesus because he loved Jesus, and he didn't want Jesus to die. So Peter tried to stop Jesus from doing the very thing that God sent Jesus to do for our salvation. So Jesus rebuked Peter and he said to him, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Another example of how uh, our conversations uh, can, uh, in a sense, be uh, used uh, by God and uh, we, is an ex example is the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples the night before he, he was uh, taken uh, to be uh, crucified. He's with them in the upper room and he warned his disciples to watch and pray because their faith would be tested by Satan. And particularly, he turns to Peter and he says to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. Simon, that your faith may not fail you. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But Peter replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. And Jesus answered him, he said, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Now, to deny Jesus for Peter was unthinkable. He loved Peter, yet within, I mean, he loved Jesus. And yet, within hours, Peter denied Jesus three times. And you have to ask yourself, how could that happen? How could Peter fail so miserably, despite his good intentions, to support Jesus? You know, we all have good intentions, and uh, we all want to do what is right. We all want to do uh, the will of God. But then the question is, then, why do we fail so miserably sometimes? And Jesus tells us the reason. He says that Satan constantly is working to distract us from doing God's will and constantly working to destroy our relationship with the Lord. One of my favorite uh, apostles is the Apostle Paul, and I love his honesty, and I love the way he talks about his spiritual struggle in his life. He said, I don't understand what I do, 
for what I want to do, I do not do, and what I hate, that which I do. Does that sound familiar? Uh, he had all these good intentions, but he wasn't able to fulfill them. Again, uh, Paul wrote, he said, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put the full armor of God on so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the power of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul was very aware that we are involved in a spiritual battle, and he said you cannot possibly succeed except with the help of God. We need to put on the help of God if we're going to be able to fight that battle. You know, if you are like me, uh, frequently when I am struggling, and particularly if I'm, I have a personal problem and a, or, or a spiritual problem, uh, I want to get rid of it. And so I ask God to take the problem away. And the servants, too, wanted to pull out the weeds and get rid of the problem. But the owner said, no. Uh, you will hurt the good that God wants to do, so leave it alone. And you know, what I found out in my life is that instead of taking my problems away, God has brought me closer to him, and he's taught me to rely on his grace for my needs. Uh, he didn't make my life easier. He made me stronger. The good seed represents people of faith. It represents people like you and me. Jesus describes us as sons of the kingdom, a son is a child who is cherished, somebody who is intimately connected to God, someone who God loves, someone who is an heir of God's kingdom. A son is someone who is cherished by God. And a, a son is, is a child who has received God's salvation as a gift. You know, as we, we experience the grace of God in our life and as, as we are drawn closer to Christ, the Holy Spirit transforms our life so that we bear much fruit. And the fruit of faith and our fruit of the relationship that we have with the Lord is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul said that those who belong to Christ have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and its desires. If you can think of the parable and the world being broken, God literally has put people in the world who are going to bring the love of God into the world so that, so that the peace of God and the love of God might be there to heal the brokenness that is there. You know, the Bible, uh, in this parable, uh, we hear about there are two different kinds of people. Uh, the sons of God and also the sons of the devil. Uh, but the truth is that we are all sinners we're all saved only by the grace of God. And in this parable, Jesus said, no one will know who is good and who is bad until the time of the harvest. Until the judgment, all our lives are intertwined. They look the same. And Jesus is clear that God allows this so that there will be a full harvest and the blessing of God might be fully realized. One of the worst things that we can do is that we begin to judge others. Instead, God calls us to love them. And this is what Christ did for us. Paul reminds us, he said, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners... Christ died for us. You know, there's always hope for everyone. There's hope for every person. Just think of what happened on the cross. Uh, Jesus, when he was crucified on the left and right, had two thieves crucified with him. And they were notorious sinners. But they saw that Jesus struggled and he forgave his enemies. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then one of the thieves turned to him and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He experienced that love of Jesus, and he turned to him and said, remember me. And Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. You know, uh, today 
I don't know what your uh, spiritual life is like. I don't know what your struggle is. I don't know what your faith in God is. But I do know one thing, that Jesus is saying to you, today, I love you. Today, I want to be in a relationship with you. Today, I want you to know I love you. Today, I want to bless your life. Just turn to me, and I will bless you. Over and over, Jesus told his disciples that God did not want them to be like the world, but he wanted them in the world, that's for sure. Jesus prayed for the disciples. He prayed for all those who would believe in him, and he prayed this way. He said, Father, my prayer is not for them, for you to take them out of the world, but that you might protect them from the evil one. They are not in the world, Father, just like I am not in of it. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And for them, I have been sanctified, that they too may be fully sanctified. You know, when we think about our Lord and his life, Jesus was sanctified because he committed himself to doing God's will. And even in the midst of his spiritual struggle, uh, he prayed, Father, not my will, but thine be done. And he yielded his life to do the will of God, even though it was difficult, and he went to the cross and he died for us that we might have eternal life. And in this prayer, he prays to the Father that we too might be sanctified to do the will of the Father. And if you can think of Jesus planting people into the world, uh, you have been planted by God to grow in your faith where you are, in your family, in your neighborhood, in your job, in your school, in your church, wherever you are, and whatever relationships you share, God has put you there to be a blessing. When I first read this parable, what struck me first about this parable was the judgment of God. Uh, it struck me because it was so clear that the judgment of God is coming and there will be an accountability for sin. And frankly, it troubled me. Then I realized that the focus of the parable was not on the judgment, but God's desire to have a harvest. Jesus died to empty hell, to give eternal life to all who would believe in him. And we too are called by God not to judge others, but to love them. May we together this morning and going forward join Jesus on his mission to make sure that hell is empty and heaven is full. God loves you. Uh, God is with you. Uh, hold on to his love and be safe. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We come to our Lord in prayer. O oh, merciful Father, hear your people as they pray in the name of Jesus on behalf of all manner and conditions of people. Almighty Father, show us the way to sow your gospel in the fields around us and help us to keep the tares from choking out your word with us and with others. Let your church continue to be the good soil that produces wheat for your harvest. When we are fearful of our enemies and weary of the struggle, you have been our shield and our strength. Grant to us the full measure of your grace to sustain us against all who are against us. Continue to raise up witnesses in this and every place to faithfully proclaim your word. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
Faithful God, the future is in your hands, and only you know what is to come. In these stressful times of turbulence and disruption in our daily lives, remove from us the fear of the unknown and the trepidation that uncertainty brings. Keep us mindful that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, we remember those who serve us in Jesus' name, like your servants, Dan and Michelle. Bless all who serve you in this place and around the globe. Bless the leaders of our Senate, all pastors and teachers and all church workers, that they may be faithful in their calling and honor Christ with an obedient life. Raise up those who will follow in their steps and serve your kingdom in the years to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, give healing and strength to the sick and all afflicted in body, mind, and spirit. Grant to those who struggle the gift of peace of mind and heart. Now hear us as we pray for those whom prayers have been requested, including all those afflicted by the COVID-19 pandemic, for Chase with health concerns, for those recovering from surgery, Betty Jane Carter, grandmother of our AV manager, for Linda Van Dyke, for Dee Shigure, mother of Heather Novak, and for Dr. Miguel Gonzalez, friend of Pastor Weekman, and for all those we now name before you from the depths of our heart. Bless each one and restore them to full health by your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for those whom you appoint to be your instruments of compassion. Bless all who serve the elderly in retirement centers, memory units, and nursing facilities, as well as those who care for ailing parents in their homes. And grant that we too might be your hands and feet and voices to provide comfort and company to those who are lonely and alone, especially in these times of social distancing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful God, give courage to those near life's end and comfort those who mourn. We especially ask your comfort and solace for the family of Ed Thacker. Keep them mindful of the promise and the hope of the resurrection and the life everlasting as we recall the saints who trusted in you in this life and who died in Christ, encourage us by the, witness, by the witness of the grace that they held and the faith that they held so that when Christ comes in glory, we may be found faithful and delivered with them into the glory of your eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, Father, and everything else for which we need, we pray to you that you might grant them to us for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose and lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. Amen.
And now as we go our way from this service of worship and praise, go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.